as you'll hear in this video. I started milking cows when I was eight years old on my uncle's dairy farm in northern Wisconsin in the 1950s. And back then, I used to think it was a natural thing to do to go down to the dairy barn and help my uncle milk the cows. Well, as my life progressed, and certainly as my medical career progressed, I began having serious doubts about whether we ought to be consuming the lactase secretion of large bovine animals. And now I have no doubts that we should leave that white liquid for the baby calves. And in this video called Dairy Doubts, you're going to see why I feel that way. And I think you're going to enjoy it. As I mentioned in the introduction, I did much of my growing up on my uncle's dairy farm in northern Wisconsin in the 1950s. And though I started milking cows when I was eight years old, and I sure consumed lots of milk and cheese and ice cream when I was growing up, after 45 years in medical practice dealing with the health complications of my patients' diets, there is no question in my mind that if I could remove one health-disrupting substance from my patients' diets immediately, it would be those products made from that white liquid that comes out of the udder of a cow. Now, we're told since childhood by the dairy industry that dairy products are good for us. After all, they tell us milk is nature's perfect food. Milk helps build strong bones because it's the best source of calcium. And just look at it. It's white, must be pure. Well, though we may be told that dairy products are healthy for us, I want to point out a basic fact of biology. And that is, the purpose of cow's milk, really, is to turn a 65-pound calf into a 700-pound cow as rapidly as possible. No matter how you look at it or what you do to it, the reality is cow's milk is baby calf growth fluid. That's what the stuff is. And everything in that white liquid, the hormones, the lipids, the growth factors, the proteins, the sodium, insulin-like growth factor one, the most potent growth promoter known to biology, are all in that milk to turn that calf into a great big cow or it wouldn't be there. And whether you pour it on your cereal as a liquid, whether you churn it into butter, whether you coagulate it into yogurt, whether you ferment it into cheese, or whether you add sugar and freeze it into ice cream, it's baby calf growth fluid. Now, if you are struggling to lose weight, in my mind, eating baby calf growth fluid is going to move you in the exact opposite direction. It's meant to turn little mammals into great big mammals. And I can tell most of the dairy eaters when they walk into my office. I can see the bloat in their faces, their big thick necks, their, if you will, their bovine appearance to their body. But if I can talk some sense into them and convince them that they are not baby calves and get them to omit the dairy products in their diet, the difference is dramatic. Within 12 weeks, the bloat leaves their faces, their lovely jaw lines appear, their bodies trim down. They become healthy people right before our eyes. It's really a remarkable thing to see, but really not unexpected when you realize what baby calf growth fluid really is. Now, the folks in the dairy industry would have us believe that, oh, cows were in the dairy barn giving milk. That's what they do, and they're all happy about it. But we become so disconnected from where our food comes from that we've lost sight of a basic fact. Those cows aren't in the barn giving milk because, well, they're dairy cows, and that's what they do. There's only one reason those big mammals are giving milk. They've just had a baby. And cows are made pregnant. They carry that calf for nine months, have the baby. The baby's taken away, and the milk is sucked off of them. And just a fact of basic biology that all cow's milk has lots of estrogen in it. Estrogen is a powerful female hormone that courses through the body of every pregnant mammal, and it's absolutely essential to maintain the pregnancy. And we see what a powerful growth promoter is. We see the female's breasts get bigger. We see her uterus get bigger. It's clearly a growth-promoting 
hormone and unfortunately will also promote the growth of cancers, say of the breast or prostate. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, that would be disturbing enough that cow's milk is loaded with female hormones. But there's another aspect of this that is especially concerning from a health point of view. On my uncle's dairy farm in the 50s, when a cow became fertile, my uncle would lock her up in a stanchion and call the man from Badger Breeders who would come out and get behind the cow. He would put, out a, put on a long rubber glove. It goes all the way up to his shoulder, big gauntlet. He lubricated and he would push that arm all the way up into the cow's rectum, right up to the man's armpit. He would have his full arm up into the cow's rectum, and through the rectal wall, he would grab the cervix, the opening into the cow's uterus to stabilize it. And with his other hand, he would take a long tube of bull semen, slide it into the cow's vagina, up into the cervix and up into the uterus where he would squeeze the bulb and a squirt of bull semen would come out and fertilize the egg and the cow would become pregnant. Within just a few days, if the cow had been giving milk, she would stop lactating. Pregnant mammals don't give milk, they dry up. And my uncle just had to accept this basic fact of biology. And he would make a note in his notebook that, well, bossy number 17 is offline. She won't be giving any milk till she has her baby in the spring. Well, my uncle in the 50s had to accept that. But in today's modern dairying operations, where thousands of cows are being milked, the dairy producer cannot afford to have their best milkers go offline for months at a time. So they went to the smart agricultural geneticists and they said, hey, can you help us? Because having these cows dry up when they're pregnant is hurting our bottom line profits. And the geneticist said, no problem, we'll just genetically modify the cows for you. And in today's modern dairy herds, most of the cows have been genetically modified. They've been GMO'd. So now they will give milk all the way through their pregnancy. Even though they're pregnant with their next calf, they are still lactating and pouring milk out of their udders. So by and large, almost all the milk made from the cows of today's modern dairy installations are made from the cows that are pregnant. Well, the estrogen content of a pregnant cow is really alarmingly high. Their body is coursing with estrogens and it absolutely gets into the milk. This was shown in a very disturbing study published in the International Journal of Pediatrics in 2010. In this study, seven men, six children, and five women were each given two glasses of milk to drink, and their urine was collected every 15 minutes. Within 15 minutes, their urine is pouring with estrone, progesterone, estradiol, estriol, pregnandiol. These are potent mammalian estrogens, not the puny little phytoestrogens in soy that people seem to be worried about. These are official mammalian estrogens, and they are active. The researchers saw that the testosterone levels in the boys and the men plummeted, and the researchers were concerned that sexual maturation of prepubertal children could be affected by the ordinary intake of cow's milk. I certainly share those same concerns as a physician, after all, we're all alarmed when we see our young girls age 8, 9, 10 going through precocious, premature puberty. Now, these girls not only have to confront their sexuality at age 8 or 9, a very psychologically disturbing process, but when you follow these girls into womanhood, they get an alarming incidence of breast cancer but it's not really surprising. They've been stimulating their breast tissue with estrogens for decades by the time they get to their early 20s, all through childhood, uh, adolescence, uh, puberty, uh, their teen years, their 20s. Uh, not surprising. They get a higher incidence of breast cancer. But the dairy industry, they've not been very forthcoming about this fact that mm, we're just going to genetically modify the cows so they'll be pregnant while we're milking them, but they didn't tell the public this. They didn't think it was necessary for us to know. But as a physician, I'm very concerned. If a woman 
has a breast cancer growing in her breast, and she's consuming baby calf growth fluid filled not only with estrogens, but the protein in cow's milk makes the body produce insulin-like growth factor 1, the most potent growth promoter known to biology. And if she has a breast cancer growing, these growth factors make the breast cancer grow faster, it metastasizes earlier, and these women die harder, faster deaths than the women who have not been consuming dairy products when they're trying to combat a cancer. Now, what's been the medical profession's response to the concern about the estrogens in milk? Well, not much. They're not going to say anything about it, but their campaign, of course, is get your mammograms, ladies. After all, check out those lumps. I have to ask, why do women in Western societies get all these breast lumps? It's not normal. It's not natural. <clears throat> You go to rural China, you don't see women with breast lumps like you do in the West. They're not consuming the dairy products. You go to rural Vietnam, you don't see women with breast lumps like you do in the Western societies. Yet here we just take it for granted. But I think consuming these potent estrogens in the milk and cheese and ice cream and yogurt that women consume in such large amounts in the vain hope that it will somehow ward off osteoporosis, I think and many researchers think that these estrogens are a driving force in the formation of these breast lumps. And if a woman has these breast lumps, the first thing I would tell her is stop consuming baby calf growth fluid. Now, the female breast is not the only breast that responds to estrogens. Gentlemen, the male breast responds, and our men friends and my patients sitting on the couch shoveling in their cheese nachos and their extra deep dish cheese pizzas and they look down on their chest and they say, hey, where did I get these man boobs from? I'd point out, sir, you're eating cow estrogens. What do you think is going to happen? And it's not widely appreciated that every hundredth case of breast cancer in the West is in a man. That should give us further pause about anyone, men or women, consuming baby calf growth fluid. Now, these estrogens and growth factors are not gentle with a man's prostate gland either. And studies clearly show that the more dairy products a man eats, the higher his risk of getting cancer of the prostate. And very disturbingly, this disease starts in childhood. Prostate cancer, like heart disease, really is a pediatric disease. And studies clearly indicate that the more dairy products, more milk, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt a boy eats in childhood, the higher his risk of developing prostate cancer when he's in a man, when he becomes a man. Another hormone responsive organ that we've already mentioned is the uterus. When a woman is pregnant, we see what nine months of estrogens and growth promoters does to the uterine muscle. It gets big enough to hold a nine-pound baby in a placenta and amniotic fluid. Well, when she's not pregnant and she's still consuming milk and cheese and ice cream and yogurt, running all these estrogens through this hormone-responsive uterine muscle, it responds, but the best it can do is spin out these benign muscle tumors called myomas. The common name is fibroids. And not only are they heavy lumps that the woman can feel in her pelvis, but they make the women bleed extra heavy during period time. And as months and months go by with increased blood loss, the woman becomes anemic. And then the surgeon tells her, Madam, you must lay down on my operating table. Let me open your abdomen. I'm going to take out your uterus. And when she asks the doctor, how did I get these fibroids? In all likelihood, she'll be told, oh, we don't know. They just seem to happen. But I'd point out that they don't do many hysterectomies in rural China for fibroids yet when the Western diet metastasizes over there and they start consuming the dairy products and other estrogen-containing foods, they'll probably start doing a lot more of those hysterectomies. But again, many researchers believe it's the hormones, the estrogenic growth promoters in dairy products that are one of the main drivers of these fibroids and subsequent surgery. Consuming dairy products has long been associated with cancer of the ovaries, a particularly lethal cancer because it often metastasizes, spreads to distant organs, 
before it's detected. Uh, here it seems to be the milk sugars, the galactose and lactose sugars that promotes the malignant growth of ovarian cancer. So whether we're talking about premature puberty in girls, the development of breast lumps that lead to mammograms and biopsies and sometimes mastectomies, the development of man boobs in guys, uterine fibroids that lead to heavy bleeding and anemia and resulting hysterectomies, and the connection with prostate cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, it really has to stop and give one pause about whether they really want to be consuming baby calf growth fluid in any form. Now, all these abnormal growth conditions that I've just mentioned are tied in with the estrogens, the IGF-1, the various other growth promoters inherent in cow's milk. But the protein in cow's milk is not gentle with the human body either. In many people, the casein protein, lactalbumin, stimulates the production of acne. There's been a long association with dairy products and acne, and it's turning out that the protein turns on a gene called TORC1, and this gene in turn uh, makes the oil glands in the skin put out a particularly acidic oil, which in turn clogs up the pores in the oil glands and sets the stage for severe acne pimples. And the place where this was first noticed was in teenage boys who were down in the weight room at the high school pumping iron to bulk up to make the wrestling team or the football team. And what were they doing after a sweaty workout pumping all that iron? What do you need? Oh, you got to have protein, the current bodybuilding mythology says. So they make up a smoothie and they dumped in 100 grams of whey protein from dairy products. And... They expected to sprout out big muscles, but what they wound up sprouting out was uh, acne pimples on their face and their back and other places in their body. This is from the cow protein and that seems to be really troublemaking in the skin. It also can have a similar effect when it gets into the bloodstream and flows through the bronchial tube linings of the lungs. If a person has asthma and they are consuming dairy products, it is seen to be a major player in making their asthma worse. And this was demonstrated back in 1985 by Dr. Olaf Lindahl in Sweden, who took 35 active practicing asthmatics. These folks were wheezing, they're using their albuterol inhalers, they're taking prednisone tablets, official asthmatics. He took the dairy products out of all of their diet. And within four months, there was a significant decrease in symptoms. Almost three out of four patients noted immediate improvement. And at a year, 92%, over nine out of 10, of these asthmatic folks had major improvements, measurable on breathing tests. They could stop using their inhalers. They could stop the, the cortisone steroids. This is remarkable just for stopping the dairy products. And it's the first thing I do when I see my asthmatic patients is tell them, stop the dairy in all forms, milk, cheese, ice cream, yogurt. And I would say that to anyone who is watching this presentation, who is troubled by classic conditions of mucous membrane congestions, the runny nose, the post-nasal drip down the back of the throat, the sinus congestion, sinus headaches, the chronic cough, the eczema in the skin, certainly asthma. I would say, please do this very simple experiment for yourself. For 90 days, stop dairy products in all form, milk, cheese, ice cream, yogurt, and start reading labels. If you see other names for milk protein, the casein, the whey, uh, these are aliases for dairy protein, stop consuming it. And see is if as the days and weeks go by, you don't notice a marked improvement in these troublesome symptoms and often they disappear completely. Now, when I tell people, stop all dairy products, they say, well, doc, I guess I could do that except one, and that is cheese. Oh no, can't give up my cheese, anything but my cheese. How do I give up my cheese, they say. They say, well, start by calling it by its real name. When you walk past a dairy case and you see that lump of gouda or cheddar in the cooler case, point at it and say, that is congealed fermented butterfat. 
and it's filled with cow proteins and cholesterol and sodium and estrogens and growth hormones. And if you put it up to your nose, I think it smells like dirty socks. And I find it the smell really unappetizing, which tells me right away that maybe I don't want to be ingesting it. So start by calling cheese by its real name. But if you need more motivation or deeper understanding of the subject, I invite you to read the book by my colleague, Dr. Neil Barnard, uh, called The Cheese Trap. And he goes into the various mechanisms by which cheese gets that grip on our taste buds and our eating habits and how we can free ourselves from the cheese trap. So I've spent the last few minutes talking about all the health issues concerning eating baby calf growth fluid, these dairy products that we're told are good for us, there is strong medical evidence that just the opposite is true. Now, I want to talk to you a bit about the reality of where cow's milk comes from and what's involved in its production, really, because the intellectual arguments may appeal to your mind. This one is going to appeal not only to your mind, but your heart as well. Now, the nice folks at the dairy industry, and they're not evil folks, they're trying to make a living, but whatever dairying started out to be in ancient times where a woman who was nursing a baby was killed in a chariot accident and, and some baby was still nursing, it was legitimate to find a cow or a goat that just had a baby and take the milk and keep the baby from starving to death. That's really where milk started to be looked at as a food. It was an emergency type of food when there was nothing else available. But those days have long passed and it's turned into this mega billion dollar industry. And the dairy folks would like us to think that, oh, cows give milk naturally. That's what they do there in the dairy barn. Well, let me review some basic biology with you about where milk really comes from. As I mentioned, the purpose of cow's milk is to give a baby calf enough high protein, high energy, growth promoter packed liquid to grow big enough, quick enough, so it can start grazing on grass and meeting its own nutritional needs. So in order to keep the milk flowing, you've got to keep making cows pregnant and having them have their babies. So dairying is about making cows pregnant and taking their calves from them. So what do you need to make a baby calf? Well, basic biology tells us to make a baby calf, you need the sperm of a bull fertilizing the egg of a cow. So where do you get the sperm of a bull? <clears throat> well, you find a bull and you masturbate him. And there is a mega billion dollar industry masturbating bulls and harvesting the bull semen. They do this for a few years and then the bull, of course, is killed and turned into hamburger. Now, once you get the bull semen, you've got to find a fertile cow. And just like on my uncle's farm, the cow gives signs that she's fertile. And so she's locked up in a stanchion and the breeder man comes around and, and rams that bull semen up into her uterus. I've watched this many, many times and I can tell you no cow appreciates getting forcibly inseminated like this. I don't know of any female, humans included, that appreciate getting semen rammed up into their uterus uh, without their permission. Now, after the conception takes place, the mother cow carries that calf for nine months, just like a human mother does, and she gives birth to a 65-pound baby. <laughs> and any woman watching this presentation who's given birth at all to a six, seven, eight, or nine-pound human child can empathize what a cow mother goes through <laughs> and deliver 65 pounds of baby. And when the baby comes out, I think they are some of the most beautiful animals that nature put on this planet. They are sweet and they're affectionate and they just want to be cuddled and they want to nurse because they are hungry. They're growing animals. And I think they're just adorable. But to the dairy producer, uh, these creatures are the enemy. They are sucking off milk that that man wants to sell for his bottom line profits. And that baby calf sucking on its mother, a universal practice among all mammals, cannot be permitted in the dairy barn. 
So within 24 hours at a minimum, and certainly uh, 48 hours at the maximum, the baby calf is taken away from its mother. Now, the dairyman says, well, that's just what has to happen, and ah, they're just animals. They don't really feel much. Well, I can tell you that the most painful auditory memories I carry in my head are the sounds of a mother cow who's just given birth to her newborn. And the newborn is in the pen 10 yards away in the dairy barn. She's locked up in the stanchion calling to her newborn. And she bellows hour after hour after hour. <clears throat> the most heart-rending, soul-tearing cries and bellows that you could ever imagine. And it goes on for days, day after day, two days, three days, four, five, six days. It's agonizing to have to hear this. It tears at the hearts of everyone within earshot. Now, what happens to the baby calves? If it's a female calf, she goes into the dairy herd and becomes a four-legged milk pump like her mother. There's nothing romantic about the dairy barn, that's for sure. And these cows do not seem terribly comfortable having their big, over-distended udders uh, sucked on hour after hour by these mechanical devices. And again, we're thinking, we're told to think about the lovely red barn on a summer day with the cows prancing around outside. The truth of modern dairying involves this merry-go-round of misery. And this is where the majority of dairy cows spend the majority of their time. And I just want to point out that every one of these cows on this merry-go-round of misery is a new mother who has just had her infants taken away from her, and she is now pregnant with her next calf. There is a real air of sadness in the dairy bar. The opening figure in this presentation was a cow, and there was tears going down from her eyes. Those are real tears. I'll show you that image again in a minute. But there's such an air of sadness in the dairy barn due to the fate of these very, very aware and sentient animals. Now, what happens to the dairy cows? Normally, a dairy cow would live to be 20, 25 years old. <laughs> but I can assure you that no dairy cow uh, dies of old age in the modern dairy industry. These cows are all standing on electronic scales that measures their milk output to the ounce. And after four or five years of continuous milking and calves and giving birth, as the years go by, their bodies wear out. And after four or five years of calves and milk, their milk production starts going down. The computer picks this up immediately. And at this point, the cow is of no use to the dairy producer. Fed, worse, she's worse than useless because she's just eating up grain and not producing a significant amount of milk in return. So there's no sentimentality in the dairy industry. Call is made to the slaughterhouse. The truck comes out from the slaughterhouse. She, bossy is loaded up into it. She's taken to the slaughterhouse. She's shot in the head. She's hung up. The, the throat, cut, throat is cut. The, milk, the blood is drained out. And the flesh is stripped off her bones. Now, the flesh of old dairy cows is not very appetizing in the meat case, and so the vast majority of it is ground up uh, into ground beef and sold to the fast food industry for hamburgers. And the truth is, when you go into your favorite fast food restaurant and you order your Big Mac, your Whopper, or whatever burger you're eating, the truth of what's on that bun is that you're eating ground up old dairy cows. That is what happens to them. And the fast food industry, the burger industry, is the final outlet for the dairy industry. Again, the dairy merchandisers would have us believe, oh, cow's milk is a gentle, nice product because you don't have to kill the cow to get the milk. That is simply not true. The Truth is, the dairy barn is but a short stopping off place on the way to the slaughterhouse. 
where a few years of calves and milk are sucked off from these animals before they are killed and turned into hamburger. The dairy industry is a slaughter industry, another reason why there's that air of sadness hanging in the dairy barn. Now, I mentioned the female calves become four-legged milk pumps like their mother. Uh, what happens to the boy calves? Every other calf that comes out is a boy. Well, they're of no use to the dairy producer. They'll never give milk. So the boy calves, the male calves, are sold to the veal finisher who puts them in a pen, chains them by the neck so they can't walk around and make their muscles strong and red, and they're fed iron-poor milk so they stay anemic and their flesh stays pale. And after 16 weeks, they too are shot in the head and the flesh stripped off their bones and it's sold as milk-fed veal. Many people are not aware where veal really comes from, but what veal is, is the inevitable offshoot of the dairy industry. Uh, it's what happens to the male calves that come out when the cows are made pregnant. And the veal industry is an absolutely unavoidable, essential aspect of the dairy industry uh, due to this fact of biology and one more aspect of why the dairy industry is a slaughter industry. And due to the staggering amount of death involved in the production of dairy products of all type, I have to point out this reality that most people are not aware of. And to the women watching this presentation and to the men who love them, would like to call your attention that all these, what I think are transgressions to, the, to these sentient, gentle creatures are perpetrated against the females of the species. The female animal is forcibly impregnated. Um, her offspring is taken away from her. She is subjected to forced milking hour after hour, month after month. The boy calves are, are taken away from her. There's an air of suffering that hangs in the dairy barn. And to complete the circle, every time a woman who consumes the Greek yogurt and the low-fat cheese to think she's trying to keep her figure or to give herself some calcium. We'll talk about why that really is not a wise strategy. You're paying for this kind of injury to the, your fellow females on this planet. If that means anything to you, uh, realize what a grievous injury to the sisterhood all dairy products inherently have within them. And you're paying for this, so much so that I have to ask if you're considering taking that next container of Greek yogurt off the shelf or putting that carton of skim milk in your shopping basket, ask yourself, are you really that hungry that you would pay for this kind of suffering that's hidden away? The dairy industry does not want us to know about this, doesn't want to see it, but it's absolutely part and parcel of uh, the production of these dairy products. And for what? The truth is you have no more need of the milk of a cow than you do the milk of a giraffe. I mean, after all, would you pour rat milk on your cereal? How about dog milk? What makes the milk of a cow any different? Nutritionally, there is nothing in cow's milk that human beings require that cannot be found in other foods. Now, people say, well, how about calcium? Where are you going to get your calcium? It's the best source of calcium. Well, I'll ask a very simple question. Where do cows get their calcium? After all, cows don't drink milk. Where do they get all that calcium? Well, it comes from the green plants, of course, that they are eating all day. And that's where calcium really comes from. Green plants take calcium out of the soil. It's a soil mineral, and it's taken up by the green plants that are consumed by the cows. Well, that's where we should get our calcium, too. And so big plates of kale and chard and broccoli and Brussels sprouts and asparagus should be on our plates every day to give us a significant amount of calcium. But there's other calcium-rich foods available to us. Uh, various beans, especially soybeans, have uh, calcium. Sesame seeds, a tahini butter made from them. Uh, calcium precipitated tofu. Uh, there's calcium fortified almond milk, calcium fortified orange juice. There's lots of calcium around. 
and you only need about five or seven hundred milligrams a day. You can easily get it from these calcium rich sources. So, cow's milk products have, as I mentioned, many substances you do not want to consume as far as I'm concerned. These powerful growth promoting cancer fanning estrogens, the growth factors like IGF-1 that also promotes cancer growth. And most of the Western dairy herd in North America is infected with bovine leukemia, and these leukemia viruses come out in the milk, and they are seen to play a major role in the production of breast cancer. Almost a third of breast cancers have a direct tie, and they have this leukemia virus DNA in the cells of the breast cancer tissue. Why in the world do we want to pour white liquid leukemia viruses on our cereal or eat cheese made from these leukemia virus containing liquids. So, if you care about your health, I would hope that you're beginning to share the doubts that I have about dairy just from a medical nutritional point of view. But if you care about this planet, you have another reason to consider omitting dairy products from your diet because dairy installations are some of the most egregious polluters of our waterways. I remember on my uncle's farm the mountains of manure right outside the barn door that inevitably accrues by shoveling bushels of corn and oats and hay into these animals in the front end. You're going to make tremendous amounts of manure. And a large-scale dairy operation puts out as much manure as a small city every day, and these cows do not pay taxes to build sewage treatment plants. And so dairy industry installations are some of the most egregious polluters of the, both the water on the surface, the streams and the rivers, as well as the groundwaters. So we have to see that dairying is not only not gentle to our bodies, it's not gentle with the earth and the rivers and streams upon which we depend for all life. So, what should you do? I tell my patients, if you are considering including dairy products in your diet, do yourself a favor, go look in the mirror. Just go look in the mirror and see what's looking back at you. If you look in the mirror and you see this, well, go ahead and enjoy your milk and cheese and ice cream. Otherwise, no, especially nowadays, there are so many products uh, that you can use to pour on your cereal, to put on your sandwich, to uh, enjoy as a treat, and these do not involve dairy products at all. Now, no one's saying these are the bastion of the health-promoting products. They all have, of course, some vegetable oil and some sweeteners, of course. These are novelty foods, and we're not talking about drinking uh, rice milk or almond milk by the big glass as a drinking beverage. This is, uh, these are novelty foods. This is for a splash uh, on your cereal, you know, a tablespoon or two in your tea, uh, a, a tablespoon of the of the coconut ice cream, say, on your berries at night with a little bit of, of almond milk. These are, these are taste treats, but they can easily and deliciously take the place of dairy products that you might be consuming at this time. Now, women especially might have a question going on in the back of their minds as they're hearing this, saying, well, what about my bones? My bones are going to fall apart. And the dairy industry has been masterful at terrifying Western women that if you don't consume dairy products, your bones are going to fall apart and you're going to get osteoporosis and don't blame us. You know, that was the best source of calcium in your diet. Well, again, another reality check. The disease of osteoporosis is not a disease of calcium deficiency. That's not what the disease is. People in North America the women consume more calcium than anyone else on planet Earth. If it was a calcium deficiency, you wouldn't see it on planet Earth uh, in the West here. But it's more rampant here than anywhere else on the planet. And it's not a calcium deficiency to begin with. The very substance of the bone is dissolving. And drinking cow's milk will not reverse this. Taking calcium pills will not reverse it. It's not a calcium deficiency. And taking alendronate and biphosphonate drugs is a common treatment today. That doesn't reverse osteoporosis either. But 
it can be reversed through completely natural means. Those bones can be made stronger. And I go into that in specific detail on a webinar that I've created on my website called Healthy Bones. Now, I have wanted this presentation to, to examine dairy products per se, but if you want to learn about how to reverse osteoporosis and how to do it by natural means alone, then I invite you to go to the webinar section of my website and view the webinar called Healthy Bones. So in this presentation, I've explored the reasons I have significant doubts about dairy products and why I really don't believe they have any place in the human diet. Now, people say, well, you're going to put the dairy farmers out of business. The dairy producers are good folks. They're not our enemies. They're our friends and neighbors. They're trying to do a good job. They're trying to help feed people as far as they believe in their minds. But we've seen the truth of what their product does to the human body as well as the planet. So it's not a matter of us versus them. They're not the enemy. Let's help them do something else with their land. You don't have to grow corn and oats to shovel down the gullets of dairy cows. You could use that land to grow vegetables, grow fruit trees, uh, do something else with the land instead of running a dairy operation on it. And it'd be so much better for the people working on those farms, people consuming the products that would come off of them, uh, and for the planet itself. So this could be a win-win-win, but it starts with you and your choice when you push that cart down the supermarket aisle and you pass the dairy case. I suggest uh, that you recall these significant dairy doubts that I have, and if you agree with them, keep pushing that cart down to the place where the non-dairy milks and ice cream type products and non-dairy cheese, etc. are used. You'll be very glad that you did. Your tongue certainly will. These are now becoming very delicious products. Uh, and I, as a physician, am sure that your body will be much healthier for that choice as well. So, now I hope you understand why when I'm pushing my cart down the aisle at the supermarket and I pass the dairy case, I look at that milk, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt and think to myself, mm, that's baby calf growth fluid. And someday they'll understand that that white liquid and the products made from them are best left to baby calves. I have been living dairy free for a long time. I certainly feel I'm much healthier for it. And I think you will be too. Dr. Michael Clapper here, and I want to thank you for visiting my channel and for watching this video. I've got a lot more content that I'm creating to answer health-related questions for you, my viewers. So please uh, subscribe to my channel down here. And if you found this video helpful, please like it and comment on it. Thanks for helping to spread the word about the power of whole food, plant-based nutrition to heal both people and the planet.